guys, welcome to my channel. My name is Reading Bear, and I hope you are ready for some more stories. And today, we'll take a look at some new entitled people content. If you enjoyed my content, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel and post some bear emojis in the comment. And now, let's dive right into the stories. The first story is titled, Karen accused me of stealing my own car tricked a dumb cop into arresting me. Now my car is a wreck because he gave her the keys. I really don't care who believes this. But here's my story. I live in one of those middle of nowhere desert towns where almost everyone knows almost everyone and it's hot as hell, but dirt cheap to buy a home or land in. And it's not uncommon for old cars to last out here as they almost never rust, and people keep fixing them. After high school I worked my ass off at a local job to get my own place. I ended up buying a small plot of land with a trailer on it off of a local guy that decided he was gonna move to Texas. And the guy also sold me his old Ford Escort prior to that. It was an okay first car. Got me around well enough. Still have it too. Ten years have gone by since then. And for a while I spent a lot of my time tinkering with an old 87 Monte Carlo that I bought super cheap as it was without an engine or transmission. I loved that car as an older cousin of mine had one when I was a kid and I always wanted one of my own. I spent two years fixing up the one I got with help from some friends and finished it in 2019. Since the engine was missing, I dropped in a junkyard Chevy 305 V8 that was connected to a rebuilt four-speed automatic transmission with low miles from a totaled car. Then I painted it myself inside a friend's garage with a Harbor Freight sprayer and some GM black single-stage gloss paint and buffed it to a shine. And I finished it up with some gold Monte Carlo decals and some classic moon rims I bought from the local junkyard and polished up. I also partially redid the interior by replacing the seats and put in a custom steering wheel. I'm not really a mechanic, but my friends all helped me. And online how to videos on my smartphone really helped as well. The car was fun to drive and looked good. And I kept it in good order. That is until this mess went down. Now I didn't really trust some of the local law enforcement out here before. And this gave me even more reason not to. A lot of the cops around here are barely qualified for the job. They are practically hired with a handshake and just told to play Doom for training. Granted though many of them are really nice. The sheriff is even kinda a friend of mine. But he's really one of the only competent ones there. Most of the rest really don't do their jobs very well. Especially whenever a new one gets hired on. Like a guy that went out of his way to move to my town just to get to be a cop. In this case he was the nephew of the sheriff. He even brought his own Crown Vic with a loudspeaker to drive around town in. Let's call this guy NC for nephew cop since he was the sheriff's nephew. NC and I didn't know each other personally yet. But I was aware of him. He was dumb as a rock and high on his own ego. He was like Barney Fife and John Cena had an illegitimate son together because he was a tall strong looking man that was always giving people creepy looks and patrolled on foot up and down Main Street with a clipboard in hand and a big grin on his face. He also liked to publicly flex his muscles in front of people. One Saturday morning I took my Monte Carlo out to meet a friend. But they ended up bailing because of a last minute issue with their girlfriend. I thought meh, no problem. I'll just get some fast food and go home. I went to the local burger place and got a meal to go. And as I was walking out there was a lady outside looking over my car. She was bent over in a very short skirt. And not gonna lie, I enjoyed the view. People would stop here and there to ask me about my car and where I got it. I usually don't mind talking so long as they are polite. Though this woman ended up anything but. She was curvy and good looking while wearing a black miniskirt. I'm guessing early to mid 30s or so. Not really sure. I asked her if she liked my car. She stood up, took one look at me and snickered. I asked her what was so funny. To get an idea of what I looked like at the time, I was a skinny guy with a scraggly beard and was wearing a faded ACDC t-shirt with the sleeves ripped off, along with worn out cut off denim shorts and flip flops. I guess she figured I was poor or something. So, she was probably judging my appearance. She looked me up and down in a very obvious way. And then said, there's no way this is your car. You couldn't possibly afford something this nice. Now I have a tendency to get sarcastic or snide when people make assumptions about me. So, I said back. Oh, really lady? The title is in my name. And these keys right here in my hand say I'm the owner too. 
The Karen just glared at me as I put the keys in the lock and began to open the door. I looked behind her and noticed a beige 90s Volvo with a missing headlight and had out-of-state plates on it parked not far from me. I put two and two together and laughed. Let me guess lady, that's your car over there? She started to turn beet red. I laughed and said, oh, don't be ashamed. Those things aren't lookers, but they'll run forever. I figured this was over, but as I was opening my car door, I suddenly felt her nails digging into my shoulder. She was screeching so loud my ears were hurting. And before I could turn around, she kicked me between my legs from behind with a high-heeled shoe so hard I collapsed in agony. And true to my luck, NC drove right up because he'd heard her screeching from down the street during his noon patrol. As soon as NC was out of his car the Karen ran to him crying and saying that I was a carjacker that was attempting to take her new car. I wasn't looking at either of them as I was on the ground wincing in a fetal position from the pain. The next thing I heard was NC yelling put your hands behind your back. And then I was being pinned down by his knee on my spine and forcibly cuffed. I tried telling NC that I knew his uncle and can prove I am the real owner of the car. But he called me white trash and told me to shut up. Then he picked my keys up off the ground and actually handed them to the Karen. Then he seemed to do a hero pose while she gave me a shit-eating grin. No matter what I said NC wasn't listening to me because he fully believed her. And then I had to see Karen start up my car and drive off with it. My heart sank as I watched it sail down the road with her flipping me off. Then NC drugged me back to the sheriff's office. I'd hoped his uncle was in. But just my bad luck he was out to lunch. So, NC put me in the cell and told me to keep quiet. I was upset, but I knew I wasn't gonna make my situation any better, so I just waited. And during that time NC kept giving me looks of contempt. At one time he walked across the cell with a nightstick grazing it against each bar like he was trying to intimidate me. At least an hour went by, and the sheriff finally came in through the door nursing a big gulp. But froze the second he saw me. Up what are you doing here? He asked. I was about to speak when NC jumped in and said, I caught this lowlife creep trying to steal a lady's car. So, I hauled him in. That's when I finally got my chance to speak and said, yeah. Only it was my car. The one you know I spent so long fixing up. NC just rolled his eyes and said not to listen to me. But the sheriff silenced him and asked my full story. As I tried to tell it NC was making dismissive looks and kept repeatedly interrupting until the sheriff told him to sit down and shut up. Then when I was finally able to say everything that happened, he was furious. The sheriff laid into NC, who was cowering in a chair like a little boy and saying that it indeed was my car, and he stupidly gave my keys to a thief that had assaulted me. NC started frantically apologizing and trying to say he was just trying to help. But the sheriff called him an idiot that just wanted to play hero by saving a damsel in distress. And now the whole department would be in hot water for his unlawful arrest and physical assault against me. Then he finally let me out of the cell. I got some ice for my crotch and got taken home. The sheriff and NC went back to the burger restaurant. But the Karen's car was no longer there. They got the CCTV footage from the camera the restaurant had looking outside. It caught everything minus the audio. The Karen came back riding piggyback with a guy on a motorcycle over a half hour from the time she left with my car. She blew him a kiss and then drove off in her Volvo. The sheriff scrambled everyone, even NC to try and chase her down. But they couldn't find her as she'd already driven out of the county lines. Some phone calls were made to other departments to look for her. And I had to sit at home with an ice pack on my crotch all evening waiting for news on what happened. A couple days later my car was found just a few miles out of town. The Karen had broken all of the windows with what I'm assuming was the tire iron and then put the car in neutral and let it coast down a deep rocky hill, which rolled it into the bottom ditch which smashed the front end and warped the frame. It was completely totaled. I wanted to cry from the sound of metal grinding on rock as the tow truck pulled it back up. NC was there too. And he couldn't even look at me the entire time. My insurance also didn't want to cover the car. So, the sheriff's office was made to pay me the value of my Monte Carlo instead since NC let it happen. Which was only about 5 grand. Though that was honestly close to what I had into it since I did almost all the work by hand with the help of friends. NC also paid me another 2000 for my trouble and said it was most of his savings. The Karen was caught at a motel estate over some time later and arrested for soliciting prostitution and drug possession. 
Grand Theft Auto was just one of many things she was charged with. I got on a video call just to see her in court and testify. She looked like a wreck the whole time because she knew she was screwed. And it wasn't long before she was pronounced guilty. She got 10 years behind bars with no possibility of parole. As for NC, the sheriff all but begged me not to sue him because he was his nephew, and he promised his sister he'd look out for the guy. I'm not a sue-happy person, so I let it go provided NC actually takes some sort of course on how to properly do his job. And so, the incident was more or less rug-sweeped and NC was demoted to sitting at a desk all day answering phones, and they would be docking part of his pay until every penny was paid back. He's still regulated to desk duty half of the time these days. And he still avoids me any time I'm near him. Arguably he's a better cop now though because he mellowed out. As for me, it took some time, but with help I finally located a replacement Monte Carlo project car with a clean title. And it was the same year too. I salvaged as many parts as I could from my old one and used it all in the build. The engine and transmission were still good. And somehow so were most of the base parts. And the sheriff personally came by to help my friends and I build the new car in his downtime. It took a year, but now I've got a fresh looking Monte Carlo that looks just like my old one. You'd never know they weren't the same car. I've made sure to have better insurance this time around, and I'll be damned if I ever let a Karen near my car again. The next story is titled. The Crack Shack Landlord. This is a fairly long story, but I'll try to weed it down a little bit. This is not directly my story, but I did help with the malicious compliance part of it. So, my best friend had moved out of state with her family for several years. She was never really happy there as she is a small town country girl in a big city, so when her marriage dissolved, she decided she needed a change. She was homesick but didn't want to go back home. She wanted to live close enough that she could visit often, and she wanted to be in a similar setting to home. While on a camping trip she fell in love with a small town that was about 5 hours from her children's father and about 6 hours from her hometown. Looking around the town she finds a small house that's for rent and she decides to reach out to the owner about the details. It's not a great house looks terrible hence why I call it the crack shack, but nothing that some hard work and a little bit of money couldn't fix. The landlord tells her that the house is livable but it's definitely a fixer-upper. It's been vacant for a while and they just recently had a man that kept breaking in at night but assured her the cops were aware and the guy hadn't been back in months. However, he had done a lot of damage. He was willing to make a deal with her. If she was willing to pay for supplies, he would reimburse her, and if she would do the work on the house, and pay all of the utilities, he wouldn't charge her rent until the repairs were complete. He would also draw up legal documents that if she decided she wanted to buy he would sell it to her for $15,000 as in its current state it wasn't worth more than that. She thought it over a bit and insisted on having the legality of it all taken care of prior to move-in day. He agreed. Over the next few weeks paperwork starts flowing and she reads it, signs it, sends it back. Before she can move in, she needs to make a couple of minor repairs. A plumbing issue, a damaged ceiling, and two broken doors. She does this sends him the receipts registered mail and keeps a copy for herself. Few days later she gets notification that he signed for the letter. A week goes by, then two, and three nothing. She tries to call him no answer, she emails, sends a letter, nothing. A neighbor tells her the guy is having health issues and has been in the hospital so for sure that has to be the hold up, so she moves in on schedule and continues repairing the house. Fast forward a year. She has cleaned up the junked up yard, replaced all the doors and storm doors repaired several windows, plumbing, electrical, replaced the hot water tank, repaired the furnace, and the supplies have arrived to fix the roof. When who finally appears in her email. The landlord pops up explains he has been in and out of the hospital, but he has received all of the receipts and photos of the work everything looks good I'll be in touch. So, she starts getting together a team of friends who all have experience in roof work. The day before they are supposed to start another email comes. After speaking to my attorney I have decided that you have been squatting in my house for one year without having paid any rent. The amounts on your receipts are unreasonable I won't be repaying you for the work you have done I will forgive the first three months of your time there this should more than compensate you for the work already done, not even close to the cost of supplies. You have 15 days, which is the minimum notice allowable in her state, to pay the sum of $9,000 or move. If you refuse, legal action will be taken. 
So, she replies reminding him of the lease she signed and the agreement they made he responds with my lawyer has no record of a lease on file. When he sent your copy to you the post office returned it so technically it's null and void if I say it is. Prove that we ever made this agreement. So, she dug through her records sent him copies of every email he sent her laying out the terms. Thinking he's older, he's been having health issues maybe he just doesn't remember. He comes back with I don't remember any of that, she also had saved voicemails that he had left on her phone including one where he says we received your signed lease you can't start the repairs and move in when you're ready don't forget to send me all receipts related to home repairs. She offers up a compromise of I'll eat up the full cost of repairs and pay all the utilities, I'll pay a reduced price in rent to compensate me for my time and money put in. She even made an offer that she would eat the cost of the repairs and start paying rent going forward but asked that he accept the work already done to compensate her for the repairs already made which even this was a deal where the landlord made out better as she had put more money into everything at this point and she only made repairs according to a previously agreed upon list. Well, we can certainly try to work out a new deal but I'm still not paying these receipts, you're going to start paying rent, if you want to buy the house it's going to be $30,000, in this area even after the repairs he would be lucky to sell it for this, she tells him she needs to think about his offer, she doesn't. She calls me as I can be creative. I tell her first to talk to a lawyer, she did and while the lawyer thought with all of the correspondence she could probably win the case, she decided the house wasn't worth it to her. So, she called the landlord back and tells him after careful consideration I'm going to have decline on this offer as I wouldn't have agreed to it before moving in. He then tries to negotiate another deal still a horrible one. Still didn't include repayment of any sort for the work she put into it. Says this is his final offer accept it or get out. This is where I came into the story. Since he was unwilling to pay for the repairs I sat down and made a list of everything she had done to that house and devised the following plan. One by one she and the team that was supposed to help fix the roof went through the house and unfixed everything she had previously repaired. The new doors were removed. The old ones were still stored in the garage, took down all the drywall she had put up but had not yet finished. Removed all pipes, fittings, fixtures, appliances, and every last shingle that was meant for the roof and made a few calls and sold every bit of it to a family friend who happened to be in need of some home repair of his own. A month after she was gone, she received another email from him insisting that she pay up or move out. This is when she replied with, I'm sorry our business concluded a month ago when I moved to the next town over. No need to pay me back for my hard work on your house as I have removed everything that I paid for in order to recoup my cost. I left the house in precisely the same condition as I found it, minus the several dumpsters full of garbage I had to remove from the house and property before I could even begin the repairs. According to my calculations this fact alone should bring us even up. That was a year ago, once in a while she still gets the random email from him insisting she owes him money. She no longer replies. Thanks for listening.